Thank you. It is August 13, 2024. This is a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council. It is 6.30, calling the meeting to order. I'm gonna go around and see if every, everyone can be heard um, and call the meeting to order. Uh, Councillor Haneke. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Pam Rooney is present. And we have with us Christine Brestrup and Dave Zomek. Uh, there is no public hearing tonight, um, but we will have an opportunity for general, I mean, for, um, hold on, I'm trying to open my attendees list. Okay, um, the public comment period, uh, because we're talking about pretty specific t uh, items on the agenda, I'm also going to have the, an opportunity for people to speak after we talk about the solar bylaw, after we talk about battery storage. In terms of the agenda tonight, um, most of you probably already know <clears throat> the uh, nuisance bylaw did not get discussed at GOL because GOL did not meet. And so we've popped that you know, even further down the road and I think they're going to be discussing the, the nuisance bylaw on August 22nd. And hopefully that at that point, they will refer it to the council for first reading. Um, so let's open this up. I see two people in the, in the audience. And if anyone would like to make general com comments, it will be on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC. Residents are welcome to express your views for up to three minutes. The CRC uh, does not typically engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. It doesn't mean we don't, it just is not typical. Um, would anyone from the audience like to make a public comment? This is your, your first opportunity. I don't see any hands going up. Um, perhaps they're just listening or waiting to talk later about solar bylaw or battery storage. Um, so we'll move right into the action items. I we we do not have Councillor Ette with us. Maybe he'll join us, and we'll try to make a note if he did does at what time he joins up at what time he joins us. And Councillor Ette is joining us at six thirty three. Thank you. So um, solar bylaw, we have spent a fair amount of time on the solar bylaw. It was given to us, um, referred to us by the council back in, I don't know, December or January. And we have done some sorting to establish what, what we as a committee felt the cogent items in the, in the material presented to us were that that should constitute a bylaw and we have gone through the list of items that we felt should be bylaw items and have made some basic comments on it uh three weeks ago i guess it was um, i did say if there were questions or if people had specific comments that they wanted to make to send them to me and i did receive a list of comments or questions from councillor haneke and I think that is that is all that I've actually received from anybody on the committee. Chris Brestrup and and Stephanie Ciccarello uh, offered to take a look at those questions and if there were opportunities to respond to some of the items that perhaps tonight would be a, an opportunity to do that. I also want to spend enough time on next steps to make some decisions on on how we move forward with this because it has been in our lap for quite some time. So <clears throat> I do not have the list of questions available to me and I'm I'm wondering if somebody does who would like to share their screen. Councillor Haneke sent them to me on July 29th. In embedded in another email. I think she first sent them on Monday, July 29th at 10.54. I don't have my um, email up and I'm terrible at sharing my screen. So if Councillor Haneke could okay. find 
that email. That would be good. And I think I sent it to Miss to uh, Councillor Rooney yesterday. Oh, is it? Aren't the yeah. questions in the meeting packet? No, I'm no, okay. not sure they got in. Um, okay. I had I asked. I, must have I thought, them out. I, thought okay. I had asked to have them put in the packet back um, after we got them and before I went on vacation, but I don't think they made it in. Councillor Haneke, you have your hand up. So yeah, um, I'd like some clarification about what our conversation today is about, I guess. Um, I was frankly surprised that the questions got forwarded before they went in a packet to the whole committee because that might have been a violation of open meeting law since it clearly is part of my thinking um, and could be considered deliberations. It's why I only sent them to you, but um, and since you had asked to compile them, um, but I was under the impression we were sending questions that might be included with potentially or as a discussion to go to other committees. Um, I must say I found it hard to separate out questions I have and changes I would like to discuss about the bylaw um, versus those that might be useful for other committees to think about as reviewing this. And so I, I'd i like to know what our discussion today is about and what its scope is. Um, Jennifer, why don't you respond before I do? Well, but the other thing I want to just say in terms of if we can put the questions on the screen now, then, then, then it will be visible to everybody. So in terms of concern that it's just shared with the yeah, committee. Yeah, I have not seen them. Okay, so so we're in a little bit of a quandary. Um, I understand the concern about sharing something with the whole committee, but I was I had offered to compile and and give them to people to to cogitate. Um, and so if that didn't happen, that's my fault because I think I was not clear in asking Athena to get them into the packet. Um, you're, you're concerned that it was a violation of open meeting law. Um, I didn't, I didn't see it that way. Um, if we have the questions and I think I'm, I'm looking at Christine Brestrup, um, if we have the questions and there has been some time and energy put into responding or thinking about responses to those questions by staff, I think that would be appropriate if we went through them as much as responses have been discussed even, even if it's not in writing, um, I it seems that that would be reasonable feedback um, for this committee before we, um, before we send the document as we have it um, off for other input. And your document of questions certainly seems appropriate to accompany it. These are my concerns about the following topics and let that committee um, discuss it as they might. Christine. My impression when I received these questions wasn't that um... Councillor Haneke wanted responses from staff. It was that she wanted responses from um, other staff, such as the building commissioner, the DPW head, the fire chief, whomever else might be reviewing the bylaw document, that she was interested in sending these questions along with the bylaw document to these other entities. There was some confusion mm -hmm. um, on the part of Stephanie Ciccarello and myself about what we were supposed to do with these questions. And so at first, Stephanie and I started to answer them. And then we realized, no, they're really directed to other boards and committees and staff. So Stephanie and I spent um, an hour last week going over the actual bylaw text and um, discussing the comments that we had received on July 9th and figuring out what to do with those comments. Um, so that's kind of where I am. But I did spend time today um, reading 
the comments and questions sent by Councillor Haneke, and I can uh, make an attempt to answer some of them if that would be useful to you. And as I said before, I'm not facile at sharing my screen. So I believe I sent them to um, Councillor Rooney. I believe Dave Zomick has a copy of them. And I believe that Jennifer Taub also has a copy of them sent yesterday. Yesterday, I think it was yesterday, right. Anyway, um, so I'm sort of at a... One. Okay, so the, the um, I was looking at the, I think the document that I saw looked a lot like, um, a lot like our version two from July nine, and that there were CRC comments um, that as as Stephanie had sort of made notes as we went through that document, and I actually didn't see, um, I didn't see anything specific, Christine, to your and Stephanie's uh, responses to things. So I think I may not have the the latest and greatest version myself. Just, um, I'm sorry just, for just blurting this out, but I we didn't write any comments. Um, oh, okay. I sent the email to you yesterday just to bring it to your attention that is this something we want to talk about and do we want to put it into the packet? But I think it's still not in the packet. So not can, the packet. Um, if I send it to Dave Zomek, can he share it? Um, and I'm so sorry that I'm not good at sharing, but I, I will do that now. That would be, that would be helpful. Thank you. Mandy. And I see, I see Mandy has her hand up. Perhaps if Mandy, it's Mandy's list. If Mandy wouldn't mind sharing, that'd be fine. Okay. Yeah. That would be better. So I might be able to pull it up in my email. Um, the, right now, the only copy I have on my screen is in my own private notes, and I hesitate to share that because my own private notes are my own private notes. Um, Why don't, the minute I share I that, have it, but all that, but space. I actually raised my hand to say one of the things that I said when I sent these off to the chair was that this is just the start of all my questions, and I stopped mm -hmm. at this point, um, and I will tell you it's over, uh, I don't know how many it is, it's got to be close to 30. Um, 30 <laughs> and, and I stopped because I wanted to know whether given what we were asked to do, I was on the right page of creating questions and the questions I was asking, or whether this was a set of questions that would be asked or should be asked, not of other committees and their review, but of us, as we discuss the substance of this bylaw. Again, I think I've been asking, when are we going to discuss the substance mm -hmm. of the bylaw? And I've been told later, later, later. And the the range of questions that these, these represent are not the entire set of questions I have or things I'd want to discuss. It was just a first pass of, am I on the right page for what we might send to other committees? And I just want to make sure people know that and that this is not all of it before we pull this up if people are thinking, oh, that's all the questions Mandy has, because it's not. Okay. Jennifer, you have your hand up. Um, yes, I was just going to apologize. What I have is in an email and the questions are single spaced. I don't think they're formatted where it would really be helpful to put them on the screen, but I have, so, <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of questions, which is fine. If there are a lot more, I mean, I just don't see how this moves forward. <laughs> we could spend a year going through all these questions. So I say this mindful that, um, and with sadness that Chris is retiring I can't imagine having CRC meetings without Chris here. I'm sure Chris can't can well imagine it and can't wait. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, you're taking so much expertise with you, but you're really taking this the staff expertise in the solar bylaw. So it is that is going to be a real loss mm -hmm. to us because I don't, you know, it's not like that's um in you know, expertise that is shared among departments because it's so new. And Chris worked for 18 months with the Solar Bylaw Working Group. So I'm just concerned about how much 
And Chris, you could, you know, this is kind of directed at you, what we can do to help get this into other committees or at least into other departments while you're still with us to help shepherd it through and also be a resource to those other departments. So I'm concerned if we have to wait till we go through, till we as a committee mm -hmm. work through all these questions and even more questions that Councillor Haneke may have. And, you know, that will probably bring us to past your retirement date. So, you know, how can, I, it, it, could we move this forward at least so that again, you can be a resource to the other departments as they're reviewing the bylaw mm -hmm. as it is now with some of our comments. Chris. I think that um, the bylaw can go to staff. And what I mean is um, it should go to Aaron Jacques, Rob Mora, perhaps Guilford um, Mooring. Um, maybe Dave would like to read it. Um, and so send it to staff and see what the result of that um, review is. I think that would be more productive than sending it to, you know, the Conservation Commission, the Planning Board, et cetera, et cetera, because those people are not, um, you know, they're not involved in like enforcing this or reading it every day and it will get confused, confusing. It will be a confusing conversation for them. Um, I think it needs, this bylaw needs to be whittled down and refined before it goes to boards and committees. So I would recommend in its raw state currently sending it to um, those people that I just mentioned, Rob Mora, Aaron Jock, the wetlands administrator, Dave Zomek, Stephanie Ciccarello, and if there are other staff members you think it should go to, and then I can have a conversation with them about this. There may be some uh, changes that we want to make before we send it out, and I could go over those changes with you tonight if you're so inclined, um, but that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Pat. Sorry. Uh, it, I th would love to include interim fire chief. Um, um, and I'm blanking on his name. I have his first name, but not his last name. Lindsay. 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 Strong. Lind strong. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would like him included in this as well. And I like the idea of sending it to the departments as opposed to uh, committees and things first. Um, and Mandy, while I appreciate your 30 questions, which I haven't seen, so I don't know if I appreciate them, but the work you put into them and the work that will come up, um, I agree that holding it here is not going to be in the best interest of utilizing Chris's knowledge. Um, so I would like to move it forward to those department heads. I think this is a, a, a very interesting and very different kind of bylaw in um, because there's so much that needs to be attached to it uh, that is factual, that is uh, uh, protecting health and safety, and there's also emotional impacts on, and people's decisions about whether, you know, for different things. I believe if it came back with feedback from department heads, we'd have an easier time of going through it and streamlining it, and it does need to be streamlined, mm -hmm. um, but it also needs to be effective. Uh, we put it off last time because the state was going to do something, and of course that didn't happen. It failed. So that decision was a poor one for because you know we were urging that it move forward. So this time I think this is a different way of doing it, but this we need Aaron Jacques' input. We need really specific departmental and I would rather have them uh, have the body of it looking at it you know with their sections highlighted and giving them real time to review it and think about it instead of having them in a zoom meeting and you know because um, that could come as we go to those sections and I just feel like it would actually facilitate this um, and not uh, hinder it. The other thing, Chris, and I'm sorry, I'm taking a long time. 
Uh, Jacinta? That's fine. Um, Chris? That's fine. Go ahead. Jacinta? Um, I believe she, and I'm blanking on her last name, I'm old. Um, is, is, uh, has done work on solar bylaws. And so I, and I don't know whether you've been sharing any of this with her and that's your prerogative, but it might be valuable for her to be included in it as well, mm -hmm. um, if that's possible. Certainly, yep. Dave. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I agree with most of Pat's comments. Um, I am a little bit concerned that Folks have not seen, some folks on this call have not seen uh, Councillor Haneke's um, question. question. So I really favor, I think the idea that is kind of gelling here is, is putting it out to other staff, getting comments on the draft, and then maybe compiling those with Councillor Haneke's questions and any others that if other members of this committee had not had time to uh, to, to look at this and look at Councillor Haneke's uh, questions, um, Chris could pull all of that together with, with Stephanie. Stephanie will be back from vacation on Monday. Um, uh, to um, Councillor Tobb's question, and, and I think we're all concerned and we're happy for Chris that she is retiring, but also concerned with, wow, what happens next? And again, I, I have complete confidence in Stephanie. Um, I think Stephanie will We'll pick up this uh, pick up this this uh, work and and work effectively with the CRC. So um, I, I kind of see that gelling a little bit in this way. I did also want to mention I, I threw out my back a little recently. So if I turn my camera off, it's not that I'm not interested. I just need to stand up and and <laughs> have a different position. So you have my sympathy, sir. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for that feedback. Councilor Haneke. I support sending this off to staff for comments <laughs> before it goes to committees. So basically everything Pat said, I support. Um, <laughs> I do want to correct one thing Pat said. It's formal sessions at the legislature are done, but that bill is still in conference committee and there's conversation that they might come back. We have no idea, but in that right. sense, I think we have to assume that it's not going to happen this session, whereas it looked like it would. Right, um, I agree. Even though it's I not agree. totally Clear whether yeah, you just happen. have to have the last word. Um, I love you for but, it. But to give you an idea of questions I asked or subject matters I asked, and those are 30 bullet points, many of which had about five questions a bullet point. Um, but they ranged from things like um, this bylaw purports or aims to regulate solar based on the amount of kilowatts it generates of of project generates, is that the way we should be regulating solar, large scale solar, or should we do it by acreage, acreage size to account for things like solar panels getting more efficient? That's a that, that sort of question was in there. Questions, there were a lot of questions about the application requirements that included at the end of those questions, um, things like um, how would you define certain things? But beyond that, um, how would you use this type of application requirement? Is it something you would use to actually make a land use decision? And how would you use it to make a land use decision? Things There's some things in those application requirements that talk about migration patterns, things like of what animal <laughs> is that migrate? You know, Chris, they're all in here. So you don't have to, you know, like, which animals do you want when you require a migration um, what was it? Uh, uh, map the occurrence of rare plants and animals within five miles of a project site. How do you do that when you don't own the land on the beyond in within that the whole five mile radius, right? How do you map that? How much do we think that would cost? Are we creating unreasonable application requirements? Um, other things were basic, such as what is the avian power line interconnection committee that is referenced in this bylaw? Uh, because I don't think the town has one. So where is that committee? You know, um, as, as we get to that, other things were definitional. Um, what is a heavy rain event to you? Where do you measure it for the purposes of this bylaw? Who is in charge of measuring it for the purposes of this bylaw? And others were, what would you use all of the reports that are asked in this bylaw for? Would you actually use them and how? Um, trying to get at things about 
are we creating a system or a bylaw that is too unmanageable to even get applications under because it's too costly to actually fill out an application? And can we streamline that down to the absolute necessaries that would actually be used to make a land use decision in a way that can be used to make a land use decision? So I support sending this on to staff, but I wonder if we as a committee having heard some of how I was thinking about trying to ask these questions, do we ha as a committee have questions we would like staff to come back with as a whole? You know, questions about, you know, similar to those that I asked, how would you use these reports? There's, I don't know how many reports are asked for in here. Which ones would you actually use? Which ones do you think are necessary? Mm -hmm. Do we have any specific types of questions like that that we as a committee would like to include and ask the various staff members as they review that this bylaw to keep that in mind. Oh, another set was, do we ask this for this information or for this X, Y, or Z, or do we require this X, Y, or Z for any other type of development in town under the zoning bylaw? Um, things like the migration patterns, do we require that for other large scale developments in town or not? And if we don't, why is this bylaw different? Why is this development different that it needs it that others don't? Those were some of my other questions. So I think the the from the sounds of it, and and I um, I think that it the questions the questions are very good in terms of getting the staff people to be thinking about it from that perspective. I also had a list of. I don't know, 10 or 15 little statements or things that I would like staff and departments and whoever gets to review it also in a similar vein to say, you know, are we are we asking for the kind of information that you need for making decisions? I mean, or um, are we missing some some elements? In my mind, we're missing a section on hazardous materials because it's not in our bylaw. Um, and I think having that accompany the the document to the different department heads that we've just listed that that Christine listed um, is a really good way to sort of get their prime the pump start asking the kinds of questions that you're talking about um and I think the the committee the working group put this document together over a year and a half they pulled an amazing amount of information. They they did an amazing amount of, of learning in the process of developing this basic document. And none of us, in fact, are at the level that the working group was when they handed it over to us. Um, I I I am I am anxious for the the town staff who have expertise in the particular areas to be able to weigh in and and um, help sort through the wonderful bounty of information that we have to the things, as Mandy is saying, that actually form the basis for a report or for a, um, a, a land use action. So I'm very excited to get this into their hands with Christine's help, because you know exactly how to shepherd this through. Um, with the with the original request for staff input that I put together was just a table and it went down item by item like 17.05. Um, you know, could the following please look at this section in particular? Um, one, I did have conservation commission, I had I had wetland administrator, et cetera, et cetera. From my perspective, those are the groups and entities that have some expertise in that topic. Um, and I would look to Chris for uh, her guidance in saying, okay, maybe we don't take it to CONCOM yet, but we make sure that we have Aaron Jack's um, feedback on those particular elements that, that we're looking for. Does anyone have a problem? Chris has her hand up. Chris, thank you. I, thank you. Chris? Oh, I just wanted to say um, a couple of things, but maybe not directly answering uh, Councillor Rooney's questions. I wanted to say that now I'm beginning to understand Councillor Haneke's questions as 
prompting thoughts on the part of staff as opposed to asking questions that she actually wanted answers to. Um, and if it's given in that way, that here are some things that you might think about while you're reviewing this right. draft, then I think it will be helpful. If it's looked at in the way of, Rob Mora, please answer all of these questions while you are reviewing this draft, then I don't think it's helpful. So I understand, my understanding of those questions has evolved and I wanted to say that. And um, now I don't remember what Councillor Rooney asked. <laughs> Uh, just that, just that in that initial request for way back at the beginning, when we first got this, I put a table together of each of the, uh, each of the, um, numbered sections of the bylaw and said, these, the, these are the departments or committees that feel appropriate to be weighing in on these topics. And so it's, it's in our packet. I will certainly send it to you again. And with that came again, sort of similar to what Mandy was just saying, you know, as you review these sections, you know, think about why we're putting this together, what what we're intending to, to do um, as you do it. So um, I feel like we should, we could take a, a show of hands. Um, is the, do we need to have a motion that we're going to ask for staff input at this time? Is that a so moved? Thank you. All in favor, show your hand. Yeah, I need a second. <laughs> second. <laughs> and it now is a roll all call vote if it's a motion. Okay, somebody made a motion. Let's go around the room. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Uh, Jennifer Taub. Yes. Fre Freke Ette. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Pam Rooney. Aye. So we have made a motion to forward this document uh, to Christine Brestrup and Dave Zomek for shepherding through the, the town staff as, as appropriate to get input. That's point one. Now, can we talk a little bit about the timeline for this? What is an appropriate amount of time for these busy folks to um, focus on solar bylaw. Pat, you started to say something about uh, timeline and I, I jotted that down. I do, well, my timeline was concerned with Chris being present, et cetera, oh. yeah. Um, I don't know, I mean, I feel, Chris, do you have a sense or Dave? of a time frame for departments uh, to look at this and I'd respond to it's going to us. take them at least two weeks and maybe more. Yeah. Um, when is your next meeting? The um, 27th. September. Is this the 27th? August 27th. Aren't we meeting every two weeks? Yeah, just about. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Hang on. I, I think yeah, given the, the 27th, two weeks from today. Yeah, two Jesus. weeks from today would be the 27th. And I, I have it in my book, so I must have gotten it off of our meeting. I think we also, we also have one on the 10th of September, I believe. Yeah, but... <laughs> I will say that this 10th is... 10th is probably better. Yeah, the 10th is, is better, I think. Just from a vacation standpoint, it's hard to yeah. get people. These are kind of... I mean, busy times. I mean, we are busy as ever, but it's also some staff are taking time off late here in August before Labor Day. So I think the 10th is probably real, more realistic. Jennifer, thank you. I should know this. And Chris, you're here through September? Yes, that's right. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Phew. Phew. So let's aim, let's aim for September 7, and I will try to um, put an email together and to just send the document, the questions, and I would direct it to Dave and to Christine as the-, the, the I, I think it's the 10th, not the 7th. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Did I say so? Okay. Well, the meeting is on the 10th, but you would probably want responses oh. before then, right? You'd probably uh, yes, them yes. Thursday or Friday of the preceding week, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's that's right over Labor Day weekend. Um, so so they, Labor Day is the week before. The middle of that week, the middle of the week before. Which would be. Yeah. Labor so Day will we, have been the first weekend. If, so say by the 4th of September, you could have. Or fifth, can we say 5th? Fifth? Fifth. So September 5, comments back. And we'll we'll end up spending some time at that meeting just absorbing what what has been sent back that would be that would be terrific if september 5 can be the target we would put it on the september 10 agenda um can we talk go ahead okay. chris would it be possible to go over the comments and things that Stephanie and I talked about with regard to the bylaw tonight so that what I send to <clears throat> staff is like the latest mm -hmm. and the greatest. That would be great. Okay. Is that something that you, that you want to do verbally or is that something that you jotted down notes to? I have notes, but it would help to have the, um, document that you put in the packet up online that would be the draft okay we have solar bylaw version 3 july 9 with chris brestrup stephanie chickerell comments on 86 is that the document that you're talking about yes okay so, so that has go through things pretty quickly if you want me to. Okay. Um let's see if let's see if great. I I put that one up, Pam. Thank you. I was just about to try to do it myself. Okay. Um so in the paragraph that is right below the word applicability I would take out the sentence that says requirements of this bylaw shall apply to an LGPI regardless of whether it is primary use of the property or an accessory use. Take that out. And then um, <clears throat> in the, are you going to edit in real time? Ah, that's good. Um, I was just making sure track changes were on. <laughs> <laughs> the sentence right below that. Um, this bylaw is not intended to regulate solar panels installed on buildings. I would add to that or parking lots, period. Um, and then a new sentence. Um, <clears throat> actually, take out the next sentence. Such installations are permitted by right by building permit. That's a, that's a given. Um, a new sentence, solar installations on parking lots. Right after, yeah, right after the word permit. Okay, that's fine. Solar installations on parking lots shall be considered an accessory use and shall be regulated based on the permitting requirements for the principal use. Okay. Um, now, moving on, I have some questions about these nexus statements. Since when we wrote the nexus statements, we were thinking that we might be very, um, very strict in this bylaw with regard to what we would allow on forest lands and what we would allow on farmlands. So um, I'm thinking that we're not very strict about those two things. And 
we could consider deleting the nexus statements, but I, I'm not going to say to do that right now. It's just something for you to consider for your um, for the future. But you may consider deleting the two nexus statements for forests and farmland. Chris, it also we could consider streamlining them and adding them to those yeah. sections. I don't. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Um. Moving along, there is a section called ecosystem service, and that um, seems to give a lot of people trouble. Um, so if you go back up to page three, sort of near the top of the page. Oh, yeah. There it is, yep. So um, maybe we don't do this right now, but I think in the future, we might consider deleting that because it's kind of a big, it's a big unknown in some ways. Chris, uh, well, Chris, if you could just briefly explain to us the 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 generation of this. I'm, uh, I know the the working group had some reason to put this in. They were trying to to get their hands around um, the the ecological system within which a solar array is placed, I think. That's true. And the chair of the working group came up with this um, idea of ecosystem service. And then I looked it up on Google and I came up with this um, definition, but it is a kind of overwhelming and somewhat some ways amorphous type of uh, concept. So I would leave Man the uh, comment that Mandy Joe just put in there, consider deleting, but don't actually delete it. Um, okay, in the next section on forests, the next definition, forests, that um, instead of five centimeters, it should be five meters. 16 feet tall is close to five meters. <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> Any little trees, yeah. Um, okay, uh, next on heavy rain event. I wanted to mention this because um, Councillor Haneke asked where, where did this come from? Who says, you know, where is it measured? Anyway, um, it is a common phrase, a common term of art, if you will. Um, it's something that is well recognized by Aaron Jock, the wetlands administrator. And um, it was also found in the Watershed Protection uh, Committee's white paper on um, how to how to deal with solar installations. So um, I just wanted to say that you know it's not something that I made up out of thin air. It is it is an actual way of measuring heavy rain events. So um, I think we should leave that there for now, and others may comment on that. Um, moving on down, Prime Farm. Mandy has her hand raised. Yep. I'm sorry, I can't see that. Go ahead. I can't actually find the button to raise my hand while I'm screen sharing anymore. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it used to be easily found, but this new update doesn't allow you to. Um, one of my questions was, where is it measured? I understand that it might be a common term of art and all, but when you've got particularly... I think of Amherst where South Amherst might get deluged, but North Amherst gets nothing. We see this sometimes with snow or North Amherst is deluged and South Amherst is yeah. not. Where would it actually be measured is one of my questions that you don't have to answer now, but I want people thinking about because if it's anywhere in Amherst, well, that parcel might have had none. <laughs> You know, depending on where the rain came through or if it's on there, who goes out to check it? And do they check it every day, every other day? How how does it get checked? How do you, you know, that, that what's the functionality of it? If it goes into a bylaw, how would it actually function on the ground is, you know, that type of question I have. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay. Um, then there was also a question about prime farmland and where does that come from and how do you measure it? Well, prime farmland is mapped. Um, the Department of Agriculture 
uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service of the Department of Agriculture maps these things all over the country. And so prime farmland is actually mapped. So the, the first part of this definition is just a description of what it is. But the second part is directing you to a set of maps that actually map prime farmland. So I wanted to uh, mention that. And it perhaps might be a good idea to reword this paragraph here so that it's not such a run on paragraph and that yeah. it would be directing people more quickly to the maps that are um, available online. Can I Maybe make has her hand up. Sorry, can I make a suggestion mm -hmm. on that? If it really is anything that's on that map, maybe the definition should just be farmland found under XYZ on the map found here or something. Um, instead of trying to define it and then saying, oh, and there might be a map here that talks about it. Like if it, if you're really going to govern it by the map, define it by the map or whichever part of, you know, whatever key the map is, whatever one on the key, which, which colorings you want on the map. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have a map. We're going to refer people to the um, Massachusetts government map. Mass GIS, which is initiated by the Department of Agriculture. But yeah, I can I can see what we can do with that. The next one is soils and farmlands of statewide importance, and that might also need to be reworded somehow. And mainly that is also found on the map. And in fact, um, when we did our solar assessment with the Solar Bylaw Working Group and Stephanie Ciccarillo and GZA, um, soils of, and farmlands of statewide importance was um, something that we did map on on those uh, solar on the solar assessment map. Mm -hmm. So that is actually something that exists and it is um, defined by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. So we'll think about how to make that uh, wording a little bit clearer. Perfect. Um, down in submittal requirements um, under number one, I think. It may be um, worthwhile to um, delete reference to wildlife and plant studies, including mapped wildlife corridors. We do have maps that show, um, you know, we have the biomap, we have um, endangered species maps. We have a lot of maps that are available to um, the Conservation Commission and to developers of land that they can refer to that show where um, these things are or where they might be. And those are areas that um, people are dissuaded from developing. So I don't think that um, a, a developer in this case needs to actually map those separately. So my um, suggestion would be to take that phrase out of there. I know that there will be people who disagree with that. Um, okay. Going down to number 19 in this list of submittals. Um, there were questions about pre-construction photos. Where are you going to take them from? I think we should say taken from um, points, points of access as permitted by property owners um, on abutting properties or something to that effect. Because you can't go on someone's property unless they give you permission but it is useful often to have photographs from mm -hmm. abutting properties. Okay. I'm not sure that that actually makes complete sense. Let's see, nearest abutters taken from points of action. It's, it's a good start and we don't need to, we don't need to. Don't need to make it perfect tonight. Yeah. No. So, yeah. So one of my questions, again, on this particular definition was, what does include tree coverage mean? Can you take the photos in the winter? Um, for example, um, think oh, about think it as you're reviewing it. Yeah, all right. Um, number 23, uh, we, we say that we should show the location and height of trees. We're saying 18 inches for evergreen, no, 18 inches for evergreens and 12 inches for deciduous trees. But then we say, and an inventory of diseased or hazard trees. And I don't think we really need that. Um, it seems like it's more than we need. So I would 
take out that last phrase there. Chris, the, I just want to comment that the, the, the size of the trees at DBH is varies, it seems like, within a couple of other different items in the, some somewhere I read, I think 20 inch DBH, here's, here it's 18 DBH, you know, that's diameter so breast height. That should be coordinated, the size yeah. should be coordinated. Yeah. Um, number 24. A map and description of all soil types as identified on the United States Natural Resources Conservation Soil Survey, um, which I would just put a note at the end of that to say available online. So yes, right before the word on, available online. Chris, when you spoke earlier about the biomap, um, is, is that same reference appropriate here? We're talking about soil types. Um, this has to do with the um, Department of Agriculture yeah. mapping of soil types. So yes, we could make reference to the, um, what is it? Uh, natural, <laughs> I'm sorry, I worked all day and now I'm dealing with this. And so my brain isn't working totally well, but I will put a, a reference to the um, soils maps there. Okay. Um, number Pat, 25. Uh, Pat, excuse me, just a second, Pat. Yeah, I'm noticing that um, an attendee would like to, uh, has a question or would like to speak, and I didn't know what process you wanted to use for that. I think I'd like, I, I appreciate that. I think I'd like to get through Chris and Stephanie's commentary and then and then open it up for some feedback from the public. Because I did say we would try to do that after the solar session. So, okay. Um, number twenty-five. Um, we say that we want to have locations that are shown on the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Map um, estimated. Uh, and priority habitats, biomap three, critical natural landscape and core habitat shown um, you know, by the applicant in their submittal. And then we say down a little bit lower, wildlife and plant studies, including wildlife corridors, occurrence of rare plants and animals within five miles of the project. I think we should delete um, wildlife and plant studies, including wildlife corridors, and we should also delete the next um, paragraph because I think a lot of that is covered by the preceding maps that we referenced. Um, and there will be some things that aren't mapped, but again, you know, going back to the kind of fairness um, doctrine, if you will, um, we don't want to put solar installations through more of a, uh, a gauntlet than we put um, other types of development. And, you know, to have, um, someone actually have to go out and, and map wildlife and plant studies, including wildlife corridors, I think is a bridge too far in my opinion. Um, the paragraph below that, these locations can be identified using Amherst GIS viewer, Mass GIS, eBird natural and iNaturalist and other scientific databases. I wonder if Dave Zomek is familiar with those and are they easily accessible? What number is that, Chris? That's at the bottom of number oh, 25. Sorry. After Mass GIS, we say yeah. the yeah. eBird, iNaturalist, and other scientific databases. Are those things that we want um, applicants to be um, in, you know, looking at and trying to figure out how to map um, those habitats, Dave? They are, <clears throat> excuse me, Chris, they are um, easily available, but I, I think it's a good question to put out to staff, to myself and Aaron, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we can respond, you know, with a little more thought and okay, yeah. Yep. Uh, it, it's it does seem like a, a reference to resources, uh, just as we did sort of in the beginning of the document. There are lots of resource references, and this certainly seems like that as well. 
And maybe going back to where we deleted um, the last two items in number 25, we could put a note, ask um, the wetlands administrator about those two things. Could I, could I just add, um, and, and Aaron and I will talk about this, but eBird and iNaturalist, um, I mean, the official, the official references for developers of all kinds, when we're talking about consistency and, and fairness across all types of development is really um, the other, you know, um, the other references we have above this with the natural area estimated and priority habitat, core habitat, uh, critical natural landscape. So again, I'm not sure, you know, if we had a subdivision going in with the, with the developer of the subdivision need to use eBird and iNaturalist? I don't think so, you know, yeah. so we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that as a staff and get back to you in a couple of weeks. Um, and then on to item 30. I'm not sure about the mitigation plan. Again, that's something that we don't always ask for from other types of developers. So I would put a note there, um, highlight all of 30 and say, is this necessary? Speak with um, wetlands administrator. Chris, most most things like so if we were talking about having an environmental impact statement written for a project, whatever that project happens to be, um, these are these are probably topics that would be considered. Um, so when we start to talk about uh, an industrial application like a, a large ground mounted solar array, I think we are talking a little different standards than you might for a residential development. Um, but I would I would want the residential development to be looking at, in fact, some of these things as well. Maybe not all of them. Okay, well, it's, oh, it's worthy of discussion. Yep, exactly. Um, the next section, 1705, I think that Stephanie and I felt that these things probably should remain here. And I think that the um, issue of fencing, I know Councillor Haneke had brought this up before, but this um, reference to fencing here is really particular to solar installations. Like we never allow eight foot high fencing, except for agricultural uses, which aren't even reviewed. Um, and we don't require knuckled selvage fencing, and we don't require fencing to be the bottom to be six to eight inches off the ground. Here we would because we want to allow wildlife to cross underneath it. So I think, in my opinion, everything here is related to the solar installation. So in my opinion, we should leave it here and not put it in another section on fencing. Councillor Haneke has her hand up. I have a question yeah. about that. Does it, by being here, is it obvious that it overwrites the fencing requirements in um, Article 6? That should be noted. <laughs> I guess that's why I'm saying, shouldn't it be moved to Article 6 so it's clear that for fencing these, you, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I'm concerned about contradictory items within the bylaw as a whole because we're putting things that are addressed in one article also in this article. Mm -hmm. um, and fencing was one. Um, I did have a question, you know, as you think about this, why are we requiring knuckled selvage chain link fence? I think it's, because it doesn't it, have any points on it. It's very right. it's smooth. No, so but if a bird could you or... do barred fencing, pretty metal, vertical, fencing. This doesn't is, allow that. If they wanted is, to pay for it. I know tech, knuckled chain link is cheaper, but right. but I guess, do you have to require a specific, think about whether you have to require a specific type of fence or whether there are certain characteristics of fence that you want to require, i.e. no points, 
versus it has to be chain link. Just a just a thought as I look through all of this. It does say that the that it um, could be by um, changed by the permit granting authority. So I don't I don't think see it as problematic. Yeah, and it's also it's also at the discretion of the of the applicant unless for some reason the town requires a fence, and I don't think we're requiring a fence. The applicants usually require they require it of themselves because they want to protect their investment. Right. right. So I guess there are some questions there that need to be answered. Um, does it override Article 6? Does it need to be chain link? I don't know if you want to put those notes in there, Mandy, or just uh, I will have, I can put the notes in on my copy. Um, Keep going, Chris. On the next page, um, eight, under screening and planting, I think there's a redundancy. Mm -hmm. Page eight, under screening and planting. A redundancy that um, third paragraph should be taken out because it is repeated um, below. So tree cutting within the required setback shall be, not be permitted. Take that out because two yeah. paragraphs lower, there it is. Okay. Um, okay, on to uh, soil and slopes. Um, I guess there wasn't anything except I wanted to add um, offsite soils shall not be imported unless approved by the permit granting authority. And then I would add a, se a sentence that said C section 1704 submittal requirements, paragraph number 28, because that talks about importation of offsite soils. And obviously that number might change, so it would be a reference to something that we would want to maintain. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next one that I wanted to address is under utility connections, all above ground electrical equipment shall conform to the standards established by the Avian Power Line Interaction Committee. Now that is something I did look it up today and it is indeed um, a thing. Uh, that was suggested by Scott Cashin, who has a lot of experience with solar um, arrays out in California. So he he made that suggestion. And I don't know if that's necessarily something we want to have or whether we want to delete it. So um, we, maybe we could put a note saying consider consider whether this should be here or consider deleting it. And um, maybe Dave could ask Aaron about that and whether it's something that we want to keep in here or not and does do does massachusetts already deal with above ground electrical equipment in a way that is safe for birds or not so that's a question okay um visual impact right below there was a suggestion that all of this um, requirement about visual impact should go into submittal requirements. So Stephanie and I agreed to that, so I will move it into submittal requirements. And then on number three, um, where it says visualization and simulations, um, it's if we move it into submittal requirements, that means it comes to the planning board or the CBA before they have a chance to review it. So um, by saying with input from the permit granting authority, that doesn't make any sense in item three, if you're going to submit these things before it ever gets to the permit granting authority. So I would just take out that reference, take out the reference that says with input from the PGA. Thank you. Um, Chris, can we, can we pause just for a second? So, so you and you and Stephanie talked about visual impact being part of which section rather than being here under design guidelines? 
Um, we suggested putting it into submittal requirements because it really is requiring information to be submitted, right? It's requiring a design narrative, an inventory, a visualization and simulation. Um, so those are all things that the applicant can produce before um, he gets to the to the board. Having a statement, though, that that a project shall avoid impacts to the greatest extent possible, especially impacts to scenic views, seems like it would be appropriate to maintain here as a as as a simply as a statement see see yes. submittal requirements for details yep mm -hmm. that's good see submittal requirements can we put that in so i i guess i'm curious why we would put in see submittal requirements because the submittal requirements are submitting stuff not telling you what needs done, what needs done is the project shall avoid visual impacts to the greatest extent feasible. It's up to the PGA to determine what that, whether it does based on the submittal requirements, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I don't understand why you would put C submittal requirements because you could put that with after every single one of these designs. Well, standards. okay, but, I, but I'm saying, you know, if, if someone is saying these items should go into submittal requirements, my my preference would be to at least have a statement here saying you're supposed to you're supposed to avoid visual impacts to the greatest extent possible. Yes. And then okay. as as in my own mind as an afterthought, I was like, okay, now go see the submittal requirements. It tells you exactly what. But so you're right. I don't think it necessarily has to say that. I'm just saying in our notes to reviewers, let's let's make that note. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next page. Special requirements for farmlands and forests. Um, the first and second paragraphs here are redundant, so take out the second paragraph, please. And then um, there was a suggestion that this whole thing from the landowner shall demonstrate that the project meets or will meet these requirements. From that on down, could all go into submittal requirements. So number one, two, three, and four could go into submittal, uh, wait a minute, no. Number one and two could go into submittal requirements. That's more like it. Yes. yes. It's highlighted that way and says by Stephanie. Right. Okay. Yes. And then the next um, section is five, four and five go into special design requirements. Yes. Okay. That's fine. I'm not reading the fine print. Um, design and reporting requirements for agrivoltaics on farmland. Um, Numbers one and two should go into submittals, and numbers three and four should go into reporting. And Stephanie had the note to that effect. So that's fine. Um, under special requirements for large scale ground mounted photovoltaic installations, I think we can take out the sentence that says the PGA shall look favorably on solar installations that include agrivoltaics or dual use. I don't think that's necessary. Um, it's true, but it's not necessary. Um, moving down, maximization of ecosystem services. Um, the second paragraph is redundant. I think it's really contained within the first paragraph. So we could take that out. Yep. Okay. I'm deleting it from the first paragraph because the second one had a comment attached to it, which would be deleted if I deleted it at the second one. Okay. All right. That's fine. Um, and there were someone, um, we have been asked to put all the reporting requirements into a table, which we haven't done yet. So we will do that. Um, 
either into a table or there is a section called reporting. So um, the last paragraph in on page 11 could be put into reporting. Applicants shall report annually to the PGA. So move to reporting, yep. Um, the first two sentences on page 12 should be moved to design standards. Um, <clears throat> under dimensional standards, we've been asked to come up with a table uh, on dimensional standards, so we will do that. And Stephanie has a note to that effect. Yep. Um, moving down under stormwater management and erosion and sedimentation control, um, what we um, have decided to say is we're eliminating everything from EPA down to um, the bottom of the blue writing. There, yeah, Del uh, not that. No, don't delete that. Yes, there, right. So delete that. And the sentence that um, will be put in its place is, let's see, with respect to stormwater management, erosion and sedimentation control, all LGPIs in, the, in Amherst shall abide by the requirements and take out contained in the following and put of the general bylaws of the town of Amherst, Massachusetts, section 3.57, um, and that's called the Stormwater Management Bylaw. Okay. Um, then moving on to the next page, all of that blue is going into design standards. That's what Stephanie has noted here. So we don't need to write anything else if everybody agrees that that is more properly located in design standards. And I think someone had already said that. Maybe that was Stephanie. Um, okay, next page. I Chris, would- Oh, just, can, can I make a comment, Christine? Yeah. I think some of this might be repetitive Particularly, I'm seeing these two. So, when of the of just the prior before section, the yes. higher that. So, so just double check for dupl duplicates as they get moved. Yep. So that's duplicative. Okay, which ones? Okay. And moving on down, um, these next items are all taken from the Water Supply Protection Committee and their recommendations. And they did make one more um, recommendation, which I would like to add, which would be require that all solar panels used in large scale arrays in drinking watersheds shall be PFAS free. Used in large scale, yeah, right. In drinking water sh watersheds shall be PFAS free. Good. Um, okay. Is there a definition of drinking watershed? How would an applicant know whether it's in one or not? I think there is, but I don't have ready um, attachment to it. So let's see. Definition of there would be surface water, but there would but we would not be aware of any underground, you know, hydrology. But we certainly could could look at it from a surface standpoint. So drinking water sheds for um, surface water, you can clearly map those on a topo map. Mm -hmm. Drinking water sheds for well water, I don't 
know if how you would figure that out. Maybe Mr. Zomek knows. I don't off the top of my head, Chris, but I, I think this is another good one to explore with with uh, with staff, including our, our folks at DPW who manage our water system. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And, you know, it begs the question, you know, why just in drinking water areas? I mean, um, you know, there was considerable opposition to uh, a turf field at the high school, which is not in any drinking water, um, either private or public. Um, there was a long discussion and, and action taken on, on a PFAS free playground surface at Fort River, which is not in any uh, drinking water or private um, water source that I'm aware of. Um, so anyway, I, I think there'll be plenty of comments from staff on this and we'll reach out to DPW as well. Should we put a note in here? Yeah. Consult, the with, other... consult with DPW and um, wetlands administrator. The other question I would have is, do we know whether solar panels have PFAS in them or not? Is it standard to have them or not? By putting something like this in, are we eliminating the ability to have any LGPIs? at all because you can't find solar panels without PFAS. I don't know can, the answer to that, can, but it's something as I consider the bylaw to comply with state law that I will would be curious about. Yep. We can do we can do some research on that in the next three, four weeks. Yep. Can you put um, a note there to research whether solar panels have PFAS? On on that note, um, it occurred to me that we're actually also talking about battery energy storage systems. And I know we haven't talked about that at all tonight, um, but, uh, but we're hoping to. I would I would ask the the same question um, in that conversation. So mm -hmm. I just want to make note, I don't want to lose considering PFAS free for battery storage as well. Go ahead. Oh, there, she's still typing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. I think that might be it. That's all I have. Chris, thank you very, very much. Um, that's that's huge. I, I have to admit that I saw Stephanie's name in many of the comments, and I just was thinking those were comments that had come out of the CRC when she took notes. It was listed as her name, the comment of the CRC. So it didn't it didn't strike me that it was um, additional material. Yeah, I can't remember when those comments were made. So my mm -hmm. understanding from this meeting is that we will, um, that Councillor Haneke will send me this edited document and then Stephanie and I will put this into a complete format and send it to those staff members that we mentioned along with um, Councillor Haneke's questions and yep. asking for um, feedback by the the tenth of September, right? Right. Right. If we could, if we could, for just a moment, talk about format of of staff comment. Um, this has been good to to have captured your your comments this evening. Um, again, we we weren't really intending to have staff edit the document fully. Um, that just felt like a burden we were, you know, pushing on them. But it would be helpful to understand if they wanted, if they are making comments specifically, if those comments could be captured um, sort of in a separate way from the, the text of, say, 17.05. 
can can staff comments be bulleted or something of that nature where final rendition takes advantage of their comments but it but it didn't force them to necessarily edit i don't know which is more streamlined um i think that um listing their comments separately makes more sense because if we're asking a number of people to share comments we it would be confusing to have everybody being using track changes. So yes, it's right. better to have them say on section 1705, yes. these are my comments. Yes. So that's how we'll ask for them. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, is there a need for a motion to take this document as, as discussed and modified tonight uh, and send that to is is there anyone in disagreement with taking the document as edited tonight and sending that off to Christine Restrup? Anybody disagree? And I'm, I'm not seeing any. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chris. That was very, very helpful. Um, I now want to go to public comment. And I see that um, our attendee, our one attendee has her hand up and I would like to bring Martha Hanner in please. Martha. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pam. I'm interested that I'm your one attendee here. I'll try to be worthy of that then. Uh, I really am impressed that you're all really striving to, to understand this and, and somehow make it work. I mean, what what kind of troubles me or that I'm trying to picture is, you know, the solar bylaw working group spent, what, 18 to 20 months on this, and we didn't necessarily all agree. And I'm certainly not saying that what we came up with was perfect or anything like that. But my goodness, we certainly learned a lot. We read a huge number of documents and background material. We listened to experts. Uh, I would say that almost all of the questions that Councillor Haneke uh, asked uh, are subjects that were discussed, investigated, debated, and so on within our committee. And so I think my overall question to, to you CRC members is, uh, what is your goal? Do you feel you need to understand every point in this document, in this potential bylaw as thoroughly as our solar bylaw members did after 18 months? Uh, is that your goal? Because if so, you really need to do a lot of reading <laughs> because, because much, much of the, what's in here reflects the requirements and the writings from our state documents. I mean, the last I knew Amherst was still part of Massachusetts. And I think that we really need uh, in many places, therefore, to to respect what's in the state documents on natural working lands, the climate goals for 2030, 2050, uh, um, you know, the climate mitigation, uh, you know, the I know the health, safety, and welfare that uh, is one of the Councilor Haneke's questions that comes you know straight out of uh, MGL uh, 40 section three, you know, uh, the Dover Amendment. And uh, it's really has to be in there as the justification for anything we say, really, uh, um, which is partly why the nexus statement was in, although I certainly agree that could be revised, I would be against removing it entirely. Uh, so the, that's the overall question, because there are certainly a lot of the individual points that I would have been able to give a direct answer to as to why the mm -hmm. statement written as it was based on uh, the information that we read and the experts that we heard. So, uh, in fact, I think one thing that uh, uh, Janet McGowan and I did compile a comprehensive list of resources, which I think was sent to all of you at the beginning mm -hmm. of the process, but I would be, if you don't have it, I would be happy to to send it again. And I would say that if you have questions on a specific subject, 
uh, look down that list and uh, you know, consider one of the references and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and much of our concerns like soil types and not bringing in soil from offsite was a combination of concerns about um, erosion and stormwater plus the experience of other sites, you know, Look at the disaster in Williamsburg that happened. There was a case on, on the Cape where the uh, developer came in and removed all the sand because that was valuable and could be you know, sold elsewhere and as a result destroyed the town's water supply. So that was that all that was in the back of our minds in putting in some of these rather specific requirements. Uh, you know, we have an example where a number of acres are going to be clear, clear cut, cleared away, which is a little bit different from when you do, say, a residential development where you kind of do one lot at a time. And so that was the origin of some of our concerns. And um, so that's just the question of how deep do you folks feel you need to go in uh, to understand every statement that's that's in the bylaw, really. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Martha. Thank, thank you, Martha. I think that's I think that's our tabled our discussion on on um, solar tonight. The other topic for B of uh, action items is battery storage, and uh, so, wait a minute, just before I go into battery storage. So the list of references that Martha just referenced um, was in the packet a number of times uh, toward the beginning of our tenure with this bylaw. And there are at least, uh, it's, it's called resources and there are at least 10 different documents in there their four-year use. They were in our, our um, SharePoint site uh, folder and rather than having them repeated, it's really, really bulky. I just, you know, go back and look at those. Those are the references that, that she just talked about. Um, battery storage. We were provided from Chris Brestrup a draft of a, um, a document that, that she had worked on or that she, that you and staff, I guess, had worked on. And that um as well as a an example from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and um I had taken I had sort of taken it out to see how much of the material from the battery storage draft which is which is dated revision 11 123 as the last the last go through um a lot of the topics are similar to what is in the solar bylaw. It is it is clearly a much shorter document. I wanted to raise the question of of a standalone battery energy storage BES bylaw or a combined BES and solar bylaw. And does it make sense to have something in hand quicker with a with a more I I'll just say a shorter best bylaw? And I'm looking for some feedback um, thoughts from people. Jennifer, um, well, I would be to to know what staff. <laughs> to have staff input on this, but I just want to ask, so you do, we never have a bad, or do we ever have a battery storage? We could have it apart from a solar installation, yeah. right? Yeah. So then Chris, it might you, be helpful to have a standalone. I don't know. Chris, do you, um, do you want to explain the, the purpose even for having started working on one? Um, yeah, I, started working on it because we did actually have a battery storage um, project come before the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I think it was maybe the summer of 2023. It seems like a long time ago, but in any event, it was approved. 
we didn't have any battery storage bylaw. The ZBA did a great job of reviewing it, and um, you know I didn't see any problems with that. But is that, is that the Hickory Ridge project? Nope, it's a project out on Sunderland Road that gotcha. probably not many people know about because it hasn't been built yet. Um, but it's at the place where Annie's Garden Center used to be, yeah. and it's going to be pretty big. Um, but we had, you know, good advice and good review, and we took our time and took care. So I think it's it's good. But in any event, a lot of cities and towns do have separate battery energy storage bylaws. Um, Hadley has one, I believe. Um, Athol has one. Um, can't name all of the cities and towns that have them, but Ware has one. Um, so we had uh, a planner here, Rob Wachilla, who had been working in Ware, and he had worked with the Piner Valley Planning Commission to develop a battery energy storage bylaw for Ware. And so um, I took what he had written for Ware, knowing that he had worked with Piner Valley Planning Commission, and I... Um, adapted it for Amherst. So that's pretty much what we have here before you. And my own feeling is it's worth having a separate bylaw. Um, I think it's going to be hard to merge the two. It would take a lot of editing. And so, um, you know, this, this what I've got here is, is written. So my Im <laughs> impulse is to work with what is written rather than try to merge the two. But it's, it's just me. Uh, Councillor Haneke. So I think my impulse is the same as Christine's. Um, while there's a lot of duplication, the duplication seems to be a lot within the application requirements, mm -hmm. um, which again, I'd have all the same questions I have for the solar ones in terms of things like that. Um, but when you get to design and site standards and all, I, I think about how would you merge this? You'd need sort of, you'd have, if you've merged this into solar, you would probably have application requirements that would apply to all. And then you'd have like design standards for solar and then design standards for best. And then, you know, dimensional setbacks for solar and dimensional setbacks for best. So you'd basically have two within one because they might be different. Um, and so it might just be cleaner to do them separately. I I do wonder, as I read through some of this, some of it I believe is not legal under state law, given some of the municipal law unit decisions that I read about beat best systems, um, particularly requirements for the best system owner to pay for fire training um because that is the municipal law unit has said that's just not legally allowable um i i only skimmed this quickly the other thing i noticed though was the current draft puts the the permit standard whether it's special permit or site plan review within the draft of the bylaw instead of within how we do it within a article three or whatever it is of our zoning bylaw. Um, so I think a lot of it needs pulled out and we'd need to see an article three. And then I actually had questions in looking at that. Um, and so as we, if we're gonna work on this and as we go through, you know, it, it talks about design and, uh, which section was it? Um, general requirements, um, you know, A, B, and C deal with tier three and four systems. And then there's, but there's talk about um, co-located and bad building integrated and things that it's applicable to. And so I'm curious as we pull that out into our land use chart, how would we deal with tiers one, two, three, and four? Four different tiers, although maybe there's only three different tiers. There are four different tiers of battery energy systems. And how would they look in the land use chart? And then also how would they look based on this other issue in applicability of 
building integrated best, co-located best, best not associated with solar, you know, which right. seems to be there's like four times three, 12 different ways of having best systems based on this tract. And would each one have its own line on how it gets permitted? Um, I had some questions similar to that on solar, which some of your your comments today kind of took care of maybe on what what solar requires a special permit versus something else. Um, but here it seems like it's really confusing and I'd like to see the land use chart um, on when it would be special permit. And that seems to be what would need to be pulled out of this, but it looks like it might be how this is written 12 different potential land use line items, um, which could get very complicated. So uh, maybe there's a way to rethink these various tiers versus where they exist, whether they're co-located or within this or not, and mm -hmm. all of that, and whether we can simplify that too. Thank you. Chris. Yes, I agree this takes another look. I haven't really looked at it very carefully since last November. And um, I do think that um, all of these battery energy storage systems, if they're standalone, should be by special permit with the Zoning Board of Appeals because they are always changing and they're, you know, if anything about solar is potentially dangerous, it's these things. So I think that the Zoning Board of Appeals mm -hmm. is the proper board to consider them. Thank you. Thank you. And I was I was thinking through our solar and and wondering if if there is sufficient coverage of battery storage components within a solar project. Um, you know, do we cover do we cover the safety considerations um, that if the staff are looking at the solar uh, the solar bylaw that we talked through tonight uh could they also please make sure that there is sufficient coverage of of battery storage um if in fact that's falls under the solar bylaw um i just want to make sure that that um just because just because it's not a standalone or because we have a standalone battery storage bylaw that somehow we don't deal with it adequately in the solar bylaw mandy i'm just curious about chris's comment about everything should be a special permit because if my understanding is correct from reading this only tiers three and four had a special permit associated with it. Um, tiers one and two didn't potentially seem to. This is where I was confusing and I'd like to see the use chart. Um, but then also some of this seemed to indicate that building integrated battery storage systems just need a approval from the building commissioner. Again, again, it was very confusing um as to where when how all of that which is why i think we need to pull some of that out into a land use chart mm -hmm. yep agreed um i'm actually going to call on i i see we have a participant with her hand up and i'm going to call on her because i think there was probably some discussion on this topic. Martha Hanner, you have your your hand up. So you're opening up public comment again? I'm opening up public comment in the middle of our battery storage discussion, yes. Thank you, Pam. Yes, I I did a considerable amount of, of reading at the time when we were considering the battery storage. And of course, the problem right now is these large batteries that are based on the lithium ion technology do have this documented tendency to overheat. If there might be a short circuit, there might be some failure in the cooling system, who knows what, they overheat. And that has led to some really serious fires, release of toxic gases, release of toxins uh, into the 
uh, ground, which means into the water supplies and so on. And so, uh, first of all, I think that's one good argument for having a separate battery storage requirement and, 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 and bylaw. And many of those batteries are different from the uh, ones, you know, much larger, say, than the ones used for solar. And battery designs, I'm sure, are going to change within the next decade or so. I mean, there's a lot of research going on to try to replace the lithium ion batteries with something more stable. And so a separate bylaw will mean it's a lot more flexible and can be more easily adapted as the designs change. Um, but also I would like to uh, uh, question one thing that uh, Councillor Haneke stated. Uh, their standards requiring local fire department annual training are a standard feature of all these battery storage requirements and solar bylaws um, statewide, countrywide. And there have the analyses of some of the serious fires. And again, these are in the reference list that we uh, gave to you. Uh, the problem was that the local fire department had not been trained and did not know how to respond uh, to the dangers. And so it's standard procedure to have uh, the developer, the person who owns the battery, uh, give an annual training to the local fire department. And I would suggest having a look at NFPA 855 uh, for a discussion of that, as well as you know state laws and so on. Uh, for that. But I think that for our case, for the solar bylaw, we put in a, a few specific requirements, but the most important requirement simply is that the Amherst Fire Department must review and approve the design before the PGA can uh, uh, give a permit for, for building. Um, and they are the ones who are responsible for following all of what's going on with battery design, the, the state laws, the NFPA investigations and so on. So I think that is our backup. Plus, uh, if you look in the solar bylaw, the very first requirement under battery storage is one that came from Janet McGowan, who is uh, based on her legal uh, experience that states that, um, I don't quite have the wording in my head, but that the the developer is responsible for providing a battery that uh, will, you know, uh, prevent, you know, fires and explosions and so on if it overheats. I mean, the responsibility is on the developer uh, to make the, the necessary um, design to minimize the hazards as far as possible. And so I, I suggest that that requirement also should be in the battery storage law. Uh, but, but I think the general requirements uh, will be sufficient as long as the fire department uh, are the ones that has to uh, analyze and approve every, every um, particular proposal. So thank you. Thank you, Martha. Closing closing public comment back to back to battery storage discussion. Um, I'm looking at Christine Brestrup and Dave Zomack as we look at uh, this parallel track. It reminds me, sadly, of the uh, rental registration bylaw from which we spun an update of the nuisance bylaw, and it's you know they're they're part and parcel. And these two pieces really seem that they should be in parallel. Chris, do you, are you planning to spend any more time on battery storage? It has not been specifically directed to the CRC. It is something that, that is um, currently in just in the hands of staff. Maybe the two of you could talk about that a little bit. Um, I have a limited amount of time that I'm here. I have, I think, six weeks or seven weeks. Um, there may be a chance that I'll come back and work part-time after I retire, but that's up to others to determine that. Um, and so I, and 
we currently have um, one planner vacancy. Yeah. So I have limited time to, um, you know, work in great detail on the battery energy storage system. So I guess that's my answer that I can yeah. probably spend some time on it, but I can't, I can't promise that, you know, I'll have a finished product or even something that's, that I'm very happy with by the time I leave. So that's, that's what we needed to hear, you know, is <laughs> What's what's the potential outcome here? Um, Pam, Pam, if I could add, you know, as part of this, you know, when, when we're when Chris and Rob Mora and Stephanie and I and others get together to look at the, um, you know, the solar bylaw draft, we can have that conversation. You know, what what is kind of realistic? Again, with with Stephanie away this week. It's a little hard to gauge how much time she'll mm -hmm. have after Chris retires, but let me let me work with Chris and and Stephanie on that and just see uh, where we are. But but your point is well taken. That hasn't been referred to CRC at this point. It's really just a staff draft. Mm -hmm. But a but, but a critical a, but a critical exactly. component, or critical parallel, if you will, um, and and complementary. Um, part of, of solar uh, permitting in town. Right. Uh, Jennifer and then Pat. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm really just musing. It's just a comment. Um, but, and I think I've said this before because I've been struggling since we started with this and I, you know, picking up a little on what the, on the public comment of the solar bylaw working group was steeped in this for 18 months and they really did become experts. And I, I'm a little just concerned if I was just a resident, you know, just someone who it lives in town, that something that had so much time and expertise and a lot of the people in the Solar Bylaw Working Group were there because they had expertise in different parts of large scale, you know, solar ground mounted installations. That's what they had coming into it. And then they got really steeped in it for the next 18 months. And then it's coming to us and I'm concerned I don't want to make it we you know I don't want to hurt what's there I know it's not perfect but just the whole process by which you know experts work on something for a long time and then it comes to five counselors who you know may or may not have any familiarity with it you know I so I'm, I'm just musing but I'm just concerned that we don't kind of muck things up <laughs> rather than try and getting it done in the best way that we can. Yeah. Pat. Um, I am wondering, since this is the on the battery storage, since it's a staff draft, whether the draft could be sent to uh, the fire department for review, because they would certainly have insights to the draft that might be very helpful. And when it is referred to us, would be helpful for us in clarifying the structure of this. Yeah, excellent idea. So a question, a question might be, would it be worth, and I guess, Dave, you you sort of hinted at this, when you sit down to talk about it, you might, you might talk about, um, do you wanna go the same approach for the battery storage as you are with the solar, sending it to the various um, staff that were listed before, and uh, in in essence, getting their feedback early on um, on both of these documents. Um, what what I was hearing also is that it makes some sense to have the battery storage in our pocket. Just you know, again, we don't know what the state's going to do. I would I would feel better if Amherst had something in its in its hands uh, that that it can offer to developers. Um, Anyway, I would I would leave it to the two of you as you start that conversation to talk through that. And and the idea of, I mean, if it goes to the fire department, it probably should also go to the wetland administration, administrator, et cetera. So I think um, I'd like to have two beautiful crafted products, um, not necessarily just the one. No, we'll, we'll talk about that internally. I, I just, Tonight, I can't make a commitment that the yeah. two yeah. will 
remain in parallel moving forward. Right. I think clearly the solar bylaw is is somewhat ahead of of the other yep. the other draft. Yep. And um, yeah. So we'll we'll so, work on that internally and just see. Perfect. And so again, we you know when it's it's always great you know when we refer to staff you know whether it's the wetlands administrator um, Aaron Jock or you know we have uh, Amy Rusecki who's our assistant superintendent who is very involved uh, with Beth Wilson our our environmental scientist on the work they did on uh, on solar uh, I don't know it had to be a year and a half ago now so we're all part of the same team you know we will yep. pull those those staff together and and get the feedback on the the first document and then if we can you know kind of double up a little bit maybe we'll get a, a some comments on this 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 other draft it also okay. seems like this committee uh i know i have to take a deeper dive into the resources that have been shared with us and maybe we all need to do that somewhat yeah. i don't know i'm not no um so that we in crc feel comfortable moving forward ourselves yeah yeah good thought i i just okay. i would say also that you know really some staff have not really been involved in the process right. even the the solar uh, bylaw working group were you know some staff were not deeply involved in that so this is the time to get their expertise and their eyes on this document yes and this is our system i mean uh just commenting on on Councillor Taub. I mean, this is our system for bringing forth uh, bylaws in in the town. So, if you or the council, as this process unfolds, feel like you need some expertise that might have been part of that working group, then it's your prerogative to to uh, seek that. But um, um, you know. I think we have a great group of staff and and there may be a few finer points that you want to reach out to members of of that former uh, working group to to pull in but um I think we'll get through this. I, I have every confidence that we've got very smart people working on the staff and all of you mm -hmm. and and the council as a whole. So we'll I don't see this as being watered down. I see it as as really trying to achieve what we want to achieve um which is safe um, you know, the safe application and the safe uh, production of solar power in Amherst in the right places at the right size um, and making it safe and for all residents and and people who live near it uh, or or um, in the town. Sounds good. You, Dave. <laughs> yep. On that note, we need to wrap up. Um, and so we'll we'll um, we'll hear back uh, at least on. September 10, and you're going to come back to us with, with comments on solar, but at the same time, perhaps you can brief us on how you're, the conversation went with the battery storage. That would be that would be very helpful. Uh, Jennifer or Christine, anything you want to add before we move on to minutes? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, I have every confidence in the staff. <laughs> I was more, and I have reached out to people in the Solar Bylaw Working Group, but at one time, you know, I wonder if we had a couple of people from the group as panelists here. I'm just concerned that it's a really steep learning curve for us and I'm willing to take, but, and I just want this bylaw to benefit from the greatest expertise and not maybe be hampered by our learning curve. That's what I was trying to mm -hmm. say. Thank you. Chris. I just wondered if um, this would be on the agenda on August 27th, this um, solar bylaw or BES or anything having to do with solar? Um, I, that's a good, very good question. Um, I'm looking at Mandy. <laughs> um, if we, if we are, if we are waiting for feedback by, uh, for September 7, for September 10, um, we probably would not discuss the solar bylaw. I wouldn't mind discussing battery storage, um, but it would be sort of in a similar way. Do we, um, I don't know. So I, give me I think we need here. to get it referred to us by the council as well. I mean, the, the formality of that. Mm. 
So if you could reach out and get it on the agenda. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. But someone has to propose something in a form adoptable. And the BESS draft we have right now is not really in a form adoptable. And I'm not sure staff is ready to sponsor it for formal referral at this point. Okay. Okay, so let's let let's that's that's a good point. It's I mean it's as adoptable as the battery storage document that we got back in January or December. Um, it's it's no less so. Um, if you disagree with that. But you didn't get a battery storage bylaw right. to you in December. You just no, no, no. I'm saying draft of it. Right. But I'm I I was taking Councillor Haneke's comment to mean that she was thinking that the draft that you provided us, Christine, on the battery storage was not in a format adoptable. It was not presented that way. Uh, when Christine gave it to us as draft, that was for informational purposes only, not intended to be okay. presented for okay. a referral. Okay, okay. It sounds like it's premature, even though we would like to move it along, it may be premature. Um, let's go to minutes, let's get minutes taken care of and then just talk about next ag agenda items. Um, we have meeting minutes from January 30. That was the meeting from uh, Godzilla. We had the meeting of um, 326 and 402. Were there any changes to these minutes that people want to make? Are they, are they acceptable in their proposed format? I move that we ex uh, accept the minutes for January 30th, March 26th, and April 2nd as presented. Second. All those in favor, let's go around the room. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Ette. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Councillor Rooney. Aye. Okay, meeting minutes were approved. No announcements, next agenda preview. Um, I'm gonna ask a really dumb question. Do we need the meeting on August 27? If we do not have solar, we do not have battery storage, and we probably do not have nuisance bylaw because hopefully GOL will push it along up to the council. Councilor Haneke. This question is probably mostly to Dave, but maybe Chris knows. Is there anything coming up on the August council meeting that might have a motion to refer to CRC? I know, I, I believe there's an agenda setting meeting tomorrow. So I, and just coming back from vacation, I'm a little out of that loop, so I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm not aware of anything that is ready to come to you, but um, I will be attending agenda setting tomorrow for that meeting. Okay, thanks. I know Nate is working on a memo to the town manager with regard to um, the University Drive zoning overlay, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. He's on vacation this week, so he's not going to get something onto the agenda for next week. But it'll it'll be coming yeah. soon. I mean, it sounds like no, there might not be anything for the agenda then. <laughs> right, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Would people feel badly if staff didn't have to take time to sit with us in the evening? Uh, if we don't have anything, we have we have a list of future <laughs> agenda items. We have, but but I think we need a little preparation before we jump into another topic. I think that we should admit that we're not worried about staff. We just want a break for ourselves. <laughs> no offense, Chris and Dave. 
Let's just be I'll never go in the way present to Chris. <laughs> would, <laughs> would, there we go. Would, would anyone like to make a motion that we do not have a meeting on August 27? Uh, I so move. <laughs> Any seconds? Second. Let's go around the room. Pat DeAngelis. Uh, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I if I had something really definitive, I would... It's fine. Use the time. Uh, Jennifer. Yes. Councillor Ette. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Councillor Rooney. Aye. Okay, folks, no meeting on August 27 for the CRC. We so could all go for drinks somewhere. That'd be great. <laughs> that'd be great. And I sort of apologize because I, you know, in thinking that through, I was... I was assuming an ongoing discussion. So um, I think the way it's now been packaged up and handed to staff, um, I think is a good thing. And there'll be there'll be a lot more to work on when it comes back from them. So no no items anticipated by the chair. And I would like to make a motion to adjourn. I second. Thank you, everybody, and especially David and especially Christine. We Thank have to you. vote. Thank you, David. All those, in, all those in favor, Pat. Aye. Jennifer. Yes. Council Ette. Aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Pam Rooney. Aye. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.